Hello everybody, it's me, Ghost Critic, and finally, finally, I've made the time and finally got my top 50 favourite comic books sorted and ready to chat about. Um, uh, this tag has been going on for what seems like months and months and months and months, and I've watched a great many of, of other fellow YouTubers, and I've kind of been waiting there to hear my name get tagged and it never happened and I thought I'm not going to get a chance to do it um, and then Scott Custom Brom started asking me why I hadn't done it yet and I was like well I've not been tagged yet so he tagged me in the comment section of um, his top 50 comic books um, and I went oh now I've actually got to do it and you would think um, a comic book collector like myself who's been collecting for decades who's got a comic book collection of close to six and a half thousand comics now not including all my graphic novels you would think this would have been a no-brainer and would have been easy well it wasn't oh my god I had such a hard time with this and the amount of times I had all my long boxes out going through every single one trying to remember you know what happened in this comic what happened in that comic and it just started becoming a little bit overwhelming which is why again it's taken me so long from Scott asking me to actually doing it um, the irony of it is that I was quite tentative I'm always kind of tentative going into these kind of top 10s top 50s top 100 kind of videos because it is in its essence down to personal opinion um, and basically what you've read um, and I know I don't know if there was any rules to this tag, um, but I basically made them for myself in the uh, sense that obviously one I have to have read it, two I have to have owned it, and it has to be in a single issue. So there could be stuff in here that you think why isn't it there, and it's probably because I don't own it as a single issue. I could have read it in a graphic novel but I've discounted that. I have to have owned the single floppy issue. Um, so you can't see it but I have got seven piles of comic books in front of me um, and this is because as I was making up my top 50 kind of patterns started to emerge. Uh, one I've had to be a bit more creative with just to fit in with the whole thing because there is no chance I was going to be able to um, put these in like ascending order. That that would have just been a feat and a half in itself. So I kind of put them in themes. So I've been talking for three minutes now. This video is going to probably be quite long. So let's get on with it. Okay, so my first theme is quite a morbid one. We're starting very downbeat. Um, it, it occurred to me that I read a lot of comic books and some of my favourite comic books are about death. Oh dear. Let's, let's, let's carry on. Um, I've spoken about this one in depth previously. It is Brian Wood and Becky Cloonan's demo issue number eight mixtape so I won't go too far into this as I won't with many of these um, but it is so emotional um, it's so kind of heartfelt and touching and feels very real um, about the death of uh, a boyfriend's girlfriend and how they have a conversation um, after her death via a, a cassette tape uh, very very touching uh, every time I read this I kind of choke up um, Batman Detective Comics issue number 472 um, outstanding um, cover there this is what basically drew me to the issue but as we see on so many of the kind of Bat comics and how many times has he supposedly died but the Batman is dead long live the new Batman this was a uh, Professor Hugo Strange story centric um, issue uh, and story arc where um, Hugo Strange was basically um, ruining not only Batman's life but uh, Bruce Wayne's whole empire 
Um, he uh, is auctioning away the secret identity of Batman and we get some rather slight cameos, um, I guess, um, secret villains hidden in the dark but you can make out from um, the shadows who they are and that was Joker, Penguin and Thor, a, a kind of crime lord of the time um, but really, really one of my favourite Batman comics. It is Deadly Class issue number five. Um, amazing um, series this. Uh, one of my favourite present day runs. Um, and, you know, it, was, it wasn't um, at all difficult figuring out which Deadly Class issue I wanted in my top 50 because this stands out above all of them and I can't see, as great as all the rest of the Deadly Class issues have been, I can't see how Remender um, can top this one. Um, full of um, blood and violence, thorough acid trip, 80s throwback and you kind of get left at the end of this issue wondering if your actual main protagonist who you followed and then who you've connected with over the last um, five issues is actually going to make it to the sixth. Uh, the Brave and the Bold issue number 33 this was Wonder Woman, Zatanna and Batgirl and this is one of those comic books that if you're not um, kind of that knowledgeable about the kind of like the DC history if this is something you're reading uh, for the first time and not much DC history you know about um, it's not until you get to the very end of this that you realize how poignant and how touching again this issue is as Zaytana has kind of a dream a vision of something that's going to happen in the future so she gets um, herself Wonder Woman and Batgirl to have a night out on the town and it basically is the last night out for one of these characters. Um, I think we all know who it is. Um, but it just, it takes a reread after you realise what this is all about to really kind of appreciate how well written, how poignant this book actually was. Um, a surprise to me, but Ultimate X-Men, issue number 19, the final part of the World Tour storyline. This was <coughs> um, the X-Men trying to take down uh, Professor X's son, Proteus. Um, in the kind of main universe, this could quite easily have been a precursor to the ultimate version of the Age of Apocalypse. They didn't go that way, fortunately, and lots of characters died. Um, the, um, the group was disbanded, or at least Xavier wanted the group to disband. Um, but it was just beautiful. And of course, Chris Pacello and Art, I was going to love it. Um, chapter 5 of Saga, um, this is on here because, well, they killed the stork. That, that's just it. If you've not read Saga, I'm sorry, I just spoiled it there. But, you know, it's great when um, comic book creators, much like Brian K. Vaughan, uh, makes you really connect with characters. And they can be good, they can be bad, they can be like characters of a greyish area but for some reason you connect with them and you are extremely shocked at such a short time of meeting them that they are killed off. And that's what Brian K. Vaughan did here to great effect. Um, this is in the same vein. Um, beloved character of the time, Bru, who was kind of an intelligent version of one of the X-Men's biggest um, villains, the Brood. Um, he was in Wolverine and the X-Men. This is issue number 18 and everyone had come to love him. He was kind of like, he was like a version of the Beast. He was highly intelligent. Um, he had the love interest. Everyone loved this character. And then what did Aaron do? He cold-bloodedly, brutally, potentially killed the character. And you just did not see this coming. It was like, it was one of those moments that I, I read and I saw that last panel and it was just like, no! 
So, you're an evil mastermind, Aaron. You really are. Uh, issue 82 of Fables. Um, <coughs> this was the kind of the wake, the funeral of Boy Blue. And the interesting thing about this is, although it's to do with a funeral, it's to do with the death of, of a major character in the Fables universe, it kind of brought to light the nature and the concept um, that Willingham was um, playing around with in Fables, and that is these characters only existed because of the retelling of their stories. So the more popular characters um, that have their stories read over and over again throughout the years and the centuries were the more stronger characters, the characters that you didn't expect to die. Um, and it, it's kind of metatextual in some respects, um, but it did raise some very interesting questions um, about the whole life and existence of fables, which I thought was incredibly clever at the time. Um, Exiles, issue number 10. Um, it's strange with this because Exiles is, is basically, to a point, just like a fun alternative alternative dimension book uh, where a bunch of random superheroes in the Marvel Universe from different dimensions, alternative universes, all come together to kind of put time right. And it felt very much to a point, a kind of Saturday morning cartoon TV show type of feel to it, which is all well and good. And it wasn't really until this issue that a potential death occurred where it really hit home that Jug Winnick was going to do something um, a little bit more than your cartoon Saturday morning TV show. Uh, it really had an impact on the characters of this book, the direction the book took from here on in. Um, and it was one of those kind of uh, superhero sacrifices um, for the greater good. Uh, while we're talking about superhero sacrifices, um, and Canny X Men issue 3 and 90, um, Beast finally finds a cure for the legacy virus, um, but the, um, the, the crux of it is that for it to work, someone has to inject it into themselves but they will die but millions of mutants and humans because it had um, kind of mutated um, further to the human population they would all survive and so in uh, a feat of self-sacrifice well the cover says it all um it's quite funny because this is the one character's death who, you know, you always think when a main character dies, oh, they'll be back in a few months' time, some miraculous way. Um, but Colossus, um, he last, his death lasted years, uh, probably decades, um, until Joss Whedon um, revived, resurrected him. Um, finally, on my death list, it's All-Star Superman issue number six. Um, superheroes are made generally through the death of a loved one and it kind of shapes how they become in their future lives. And while this was more of a kind of time traveling tale, while present day Superman goes into the past to just kind of let Par Kent know, you know, his son actually makes a difference. Um, this is all about Park Kent and, and his death. Uh, but it's also Grant Morrison's way of kind of letting Superman know that, you know, as strong as you will ever be, uh, as, you know, um, powerful as you'll ever be, you can't save everyone. And of course, the one person he would have wanted to save above all else is his adoptive father. Now, I love the horror genre, and I would have expected to see a lot more of the kind of horror genre comic books in my top 50. But however, I only have five of them. Um, but they're doozies all the same. Um, I'm beginning with Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips' Fatal, issue number 12. Um, this was touted, it was advertised as a kind of 
crime noir with an occult twist. And to be honest, we hadn't really seen much of the occult twist. It, there'd been like little kind of bits of it here and there. And they were fun, and but I wanted more. And then it was kind of at the end of one of the kind of the main storylines, uh, the story arcs end, that Ed Brubeck and Sean Phillips brought out these, what were essentially one shots. And these were basically the past history of our main character Josephine and it opened up this whole new history it enriched the kind of the universe and the character of Josephine and gave her this sense of immortality and um witch burning can't get more horrific than that burning bodies oh. uh, I a vampire issue zero uh just such a great run um, on here by Jeff Lemire with Andrea Sorrentino on art. Um, it was James Donnelly who hooked me up with this book. He begged and begged me to read I Vampire for issue after issue and I just ignored him. And I was a fool too because it, seriously, I Vampire should have gone on for much, much longer than it did. Um, but issue zeros back when the DC New Fifty Two was in its in its infancy, um, it was all about the origins of the characters, and here we saw the the tragic um, beginnings of Andrew Bennett um, becoming a vampire. Um, just a great book, beautiful art by Andrea Sorrentino, and just so well told by. Um, by uh, Joshua Hale Falkov. I'm sorry I said Jeff Lemire at the beginning, didn't I? No, it was Falkov. Um, the Man Thing. Um, yes, issue number 22 of volume one. Um, this cover, I've always said, I love someone to make a poster out of this. This will go in a picture frame on my wall uh, straight away. Um, this is kind of an interesting kind of horror book. Um, it had um, Steve Gerber in it as um, an actual character. It dealt with kind of like the creation of the character, the involvement of the creator. Um, and there was just a special feel about this book. It was the end of the series. Um, and Gerber clearly didn't want this to end. Well, I don't know. It, it, it's an odd one. I, I think he could have done a lot more, um, but he kind of wrapped everything up and there was a cosmic feel to this, uh, as well as, as kind of like a horror feel. Uh, I've only just recently acquired this, but yes, it's made my top 50, but it is an old comic book. Uh, Giant Sized Chillers, number one, featuring the curse of Dracula. You don't get more kind of 70s horror than this book. Um, it's just it's just a great, great horror vampire issue. It has all the elements uh, of um, Dracula uh, and the kind of the bats, the blood sucking, him changing into mist, uh, traveling over great distances, um, all that great stuff that you expect from a classic uh, kind of Dracula vampire movie, uh, but just in comic form, um, really great issue. Uh, finally, for the horror, could not put uh, leave off a Wrightson um, book. Uh, okay, it's written by Steve Niles, but you come here for the Bernie Wrightson art. It is just phenomenal. Frankenstein is such a classic horror character, horror, horror monster character, um, and he kind of, along with Steve Niles, who you know is obviously collaborative with Brian Wrightson. Uh, sorry, but he writes in. But um, they capture the the tortured nature, the tortured soul of Frankenstein so well. Um, but you know, I know, we get this book because of Wrightson's art, which is just amazing. Every brick, every skull, every kind of cobweb is meticulously drawn with such great detail that 
you can look at the page for hours and not have seen everything that writes and put into this book. Um, I know the guy's been ill and this is why we've been waiting so long for the next issue. I hope he's well enough to finish this series off um, because this clearly is a labour of love for, um, for Bernie. Love them or hate them, they are here to stay. They've been here for decades before, they'll be here for decades after. It's the event book. Um, now, I've loved and hated events in equal measure. I've been burnt a great many times. Fear itself. But there have been some great events too. Um, and we're going to start with the daddy of them all. Uh, yes, there was one before it, but this is generally known as the start of the event book. It is, of course, Marvel Superheroes Secret Wars. Yes, there was Contest of Champions, which was kind of an event book, but this is the one that basically started the trend, I feel. Um, and this is one of kind of my earliest memories of reading American comic books. I've spoken about this many times before. I didn't read this issue of it. I didn't read the American version of it. I read the serialised version and reprints a couple of years later in a British publication. And um, at that age, I was just like blown away by this. Um, it was like all the comic book characters that I knew about, but you know, I didn't collect them. I couldn't get hold of American comics back then. And there was just this wonderful uh, feeling of excitement of, I don't know, it, there was just something about this book that I, I rushed down every week to pick up because we got ours in weekly installments. Um, and I just picked it up and I was reading it on the way home. I couldn't even wait to get home to read it. Um, I just loved having all my favourite Marvel characters that I'd seen in the cartoons on the printed page and reading all their high adventures. And this just, it was, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Um, DC have often been kind of like, oh, that wasn't great. But my favourite event um, by far has always been Jeff John's Blackest Night from the Green Lantern um, series. Um, I hadn't picked up uh, a Green Lantern series until Jeff John started and revitalised it um, back in, oh, sometime in the 2000s, I can't remember. Um, and I really enjoyed it. It was a character that I kind of knew bits and bobs about, um, but not a great deal. And I appreciated Jeff Johns realizing this in his run. And I kind of grew accustomed and I found out more and more about the character. And he'd been putting a few events in, um, the War of the Lan, was it the War of the Lanterns? Um, and Sinister and his Yellow Lantern and all that stuff. Uh, but then he brought out Blackest Night and I was just like, wow, this is, this is great stuff. This is cinematic, operatic, um, just great comic book storytelling. Um, and although, and it didn't even really kind of pitter out to like loads of tie-ins. Obviously the Green Lantern titles uh, were, were kind of mixed in there. And they brought out a one issue of defunct titles um, at the time to fit in but there wasn't like you had to read a slew of other books to get the whole story and um just just a great great event story from uh, from dc um marvel do a lot better i feel at the events um there's a couple of hit or misses um but certainly the infinity gauntlet is up there um, the power of that gauntlet with Thanos behind it. How are our superheroes ever going to defeat him? And this is a book that certainly touched a great many um, other titles uh, at the time. Um, I've seen many um, 
tie-ins from not only my collection but from others too um, but this is kind of like another all out very much like Secret Wars but basically they're not fighting each other they are fighting the one um, kind of godlike power now of Thanos um, just again bringing all your favourite Marvel characters for an all out beaten down is this even possible to defeat villain uh, now, my favourite Marvel event as of right now, um, maybe they'll do something better in the future, has always been Secret Invasion. Um, this is a variant cover. I missed out on getting the first one and this is all they had left so I had to pay a little bit extra uh, but I just loved the concept that the Skrulls had been infil infiltrating um, the Marvel Universe for years uh, hiding basically in plain sight and bringing the world uh, the superhero world to its knees um, and, and that whole distrustful nature that the characters then had to bring into the mix of like well they're actually a bit odd at the moment are they really a scroll are they really a scroll and um, I would love to think that there are still some characters out there that are still scrolls that haven't been discovered or found out. Um, I joked at the time, I joke every time about this, I still hope and pray that Cyclops is actually a scroll. Um, <clears throat> Event books don't have to happen over a series of issues either. It could be like an anniversary issue. And I have two from one of my favourite runs of all time. Not the favourite, but it is Fables 100 and the just released Fables 150. Uh, what both of these do is... Um, they do what they're meant to do. They're meant to celebrate um, a, a certain part in their publication. A hundred issues is bloody good going these days for a comic to get to. And here you get the kind of final fight between um, um, Mr. Dark and Frau Tottenkinder. Kinder. And it's one of those things that you don't know how it's going to end you don't know what characters are going to survive you don't know what the impact of the the, the consequences that are going to happen after um this issue has finished um and all, and all as always bill william just adds all this kind of back matter that you know it's not necessarily part of the big story but there are elements that you you know you have to read it I mean, apart from the fact that it's great writing, um, it all fits in, however small, to the larger picture um, and just makes it that much more thrilling of a read. And that's certainly what he did with his final issue, 150. I'm not really going to speak so much about this because I do want to do a video just on this alone. Um, but it was everything I wanted and more of this book. It was a fitting ending. It just... I read it in one sitting. It's, it's a trade. It's a trade. I don't generally read trades all in one go. But this demanded my attention. It has been one of my favourite runs, uh, especially from Vertigo and almost of all time. Um, and I just want everyone to, to read Fables. It's a great way of telling a story about stories. Okay, the next theme is the one that I kind of had to mould a little bit because these are the issues that didn't really fall into any other character, uh, any other theme, but they did kind of fall into their own. And that's the way that you take a comic book that you've loved and then a creator does something different with it. Uh, it could just be the artistic style, it could be what they do with the story, how they tell it, um, but these are those kind of books. And I'm starting with Fantastic Four issue 252. Now I've always said about Fantastic Four because this is the uh, comic book run that I want to have all of. It was, the, it was the first one that I decided, probably rather foolishly, that I would love to own the complete run and I am trying to. 
Um, whether it will ever happen, I very much doubt it. But um, I just love, and I've always said that as much as I love the Fantastic Four and all the stories contained within it and seeing them change through kind of decade to decade, um, I much prefer those stories that take them out into outer space and uh, this is certainly one of them and the, the special thing about this is and obviously you can see I'm holding it sideways was the story was told in this uh, way uh, I think they called it kind of cinema scope or something like this but the pages all went that way instead of kind of like that way and it, ju it just makes it in it does feel like a cinematic experience um, that you're watching it on the wide screen and um, just the the addition obviously of it being in outer space it's a crazy kind of new planet with kind of new rules for them to um, to, to get their heads round it was just a fantastic 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 four issue uh, this was a strange one for me to pick up uh, and show you because it's it's a run that I don't collect uh, and I just picked this up probably because it was in a 50p bin but it's DC Comics Presents and it's issue number 88 and it's Superman and the Creeper. Now they're two characters that you wouldn't normally think of putting together and I still, after reading this again, thinking... It feels very strange. The Creeper is a kind of... He's a very kind of greyish area, good, bad kind of character. Uh, but he's very chaotic and very kind of... The, the madness within him. And then you have that juxtaposed, juxtaposed with um, Superman, who's for order. Um, he's kind of straight to the point. Um, and he's very, very much a good character. He's a good person. Um, but the thing about this is, it's the artwork inside by Keith Giffen. It ain't pretty by any means. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, you don't see the slick, over-buffed, um, like you see here, the muscle tone character. This um, is not indicative of the artwork inside. I think I'll quickly show you what I mean and hopefully I can find something um, that, that kind of shows this um, but it was just a kind of I mean I hope you can see that um, this is kind of a, a special crisis crossover um, I don't know how it really fits in because I've not read it all but it was just so strange but it had such a kind of um, lasting effect on me that I've read and reread this several times. Um, so that's that's that one. Um, what was now called New X Men, and it was issue 114. Uh, it was before this just called X Men, but now Grant Morrison, Frank quietly took over the reins and brought the X Men into the present day made them in some respects incredibly relevant they they played around for so long against superheroes everything had been big buffed um, over the top pouches everywhere and Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly basically stripped that all back they put them in these leather um, black leather outfits with the yellow crosses in front um, they kind of there was a very kind of hip, youthful feel to it and it was just a great start to what I feel is a great run of, of X-Men. Uh, Grant Morrison really mixed things up, made it a more grittier, gave it a darker edge than we'd previously seen. Of course, once Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly had left, they washed all that away and the costumes came back. Um, but for that brief few years, it felt like um, Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly did such great work with this title. <clears throat> now this is going to be a surprise to some people purely for the person who wrote this. Um, Mark and Draco. This is issue one of Case Files Sam and Twitch. Uh, Mark and Draco, as we all know, a ruined Batwoman for us all over the last couple of years to the point where 
she is no more as far as I can see in the DC universe um, after J.H. Williams the third doing such a fantastic job on uh, making that character relevant important within the DCU so to have a comic book written by Mark Andreco on my list um, is quite the shocker to me but the storyline and how this is told in this first issue is is incredibly clever. Um, what he basically does is the comic book is drawn in these three panel pages um, and you kind of get glimpses of the storyline kind of you read it along the way so this the story you would have to read like three times if you were going to be like this you would read the top line of every page then you would read the middle page of every page and then you would read the bottom of every page and they are moments in uh twitch's life um, where he is um accused of a crime he he didn't commit but I just thought this is such a clever way of telling the story because you are getting kind of glimpses of a storyline, of a full storyline that's already kind of like formatted, but you're getting only kind of like a third of each story at a time. So you're wondering, well, how did he get from that panel to the bottom of the last panel? How did that all happen? And it takes obviously a, a few issues to get the whole story, but I thought that was I thought that was incredibly clever. <clears throat> um, issue ten of Spawn. Um, back when Spawn started, obviously this is a Todd McFarlane creation, um, along with Greg Capullo on art and. You would have expected them to be on the on the series for quite some time before they um, held out the rain, the writing reins at least to other writers. But that's what he did, and he brought in some very big names. Um, there was an Alan Moore, Neil Gaiman, and this one by Chris Sim, as you can see, Cerebus on the cover, um, complaining that he's now in colour because Cerebus is always drawn in black and white. Um, but the crazy thing about this issue is, and you know, Spawn, especially back in uh, its infancy, caught so much controversy um, with, within the comic book um, within the comic book industry uh, that I'm surprised they even got away with this. As um, Cerebus takes Spawn down into a kind of prison dungeon area and you have all these kind of hands reaching out um, wanting to kind of escape or be set free but the arms all belong to comic book characters like you can see there's Batman there you can see there's Superman there there's a slew of, of different comic book characters from different companies um, and it was just kind of that there, there's there's a lot going on there and I I could talk about the, the issue for a long time because it deals with some some very big issues but I don't really have the time for it here um, but it was just such a, a not an odd thing to say but a kind of brave thing to do I guess to to use characters that weren't part of your kind of imprint your publisher um, and and make some kind of really big points about it. Um, I might have to do a, a video about this issue just on its own. Um, <clears throat> my last two for these, they come from both the same series and it comes from The Unwritten. This is issue number, oh dear me, I can't see what issue this is because there's numbers, oh it's issue 17, there's numbers everywhere. Um, what a way to tell a story. Um, think back to your youths, Ian Livingston and his kind of make your own adventure Dungeons and Dragons type um, storybooks where you would read a paragraph of the book and then it would ask you whether you wanted to go left and right and it would say go to page 12 or page 50 and you would skim through to the book and then it would go you have uh, met a big ogre and it was that kind of book. Um, they had created a kind of make your own adventure comic book um, and 
it was all to do with the history um, and it's called The Many Lives of Lizzie Hexham, uh, which is one of the main characters in the book. But it was just a, a, such a clever way to tell a story um, using the idea of kind of like the Dungeons and Dragons um, storybooks from, I guess, late 70s, early 80s. Um, I don't really see many of them now, but I lapped them up at the time. So it was nice to see that come back. And then finally, the unwritten, um, going back um, to an earlier issue, number five. The thing about the unwritten is, and I feel very sorry for this title, is because it should have been of fable ep epic proportions. Because this could have gone anywhere. Um, and especially when you got to this issue, I've always championed this book. I've always asked people to go out and buy the trades or if you can find the singles, find the singles. And I always say the first story arc, it's, it's, it's not tough to get through, but it isn't instantly likeable. But once you read this issue, it blows up and you see the the plan that Mike Carey and um, Peter Gross had for this title um, from this issue and how far back the history of The Unwritten goes. And this is why I thought this was such a missed opportunity and I guess it was down to sales. It wasn't the biggest selling book. It should have been. And um, like I said, this should have gone on for 100, 150 issues because it had that big a broad um, kind of area to work with. This is all about literary characters and books and how they incorporate themselves into our lives. It's all about the written word which we see everywhere. Um, you can't get away with actually having seen, um, you know, a billboard sign, a road sign, um, a comic book, a newspaper, your internet, your Twitter. It's all there. Um, and so this could have been ginormous, um, but it, it stayed small, it stayed for two volumes, but this is the issue that made it what it was. Well, every comic book has to start somewhere and that has to start with a number one issue. Um, and so I have quite a stack of issue ones that have um, made its way up into my top 50. And the first one may be a surprise because it really wasn't received well, but you know what? I loved it. All Star Batman and Robin. This was Frank Miller and Jim Lee's um, attempt, I guess, um, at really going for it with the gritty, dark nature side of Batman. Um, Frank Miller was basically doing his version of Batman if he was in Sin City. This was swearing, although it was obviously blanked out. Um, this was incredibly dark, incredibly brutal at times. Um, but Everyone was like, this isn't Batman, this isn't Batman. No, it wasn't Batman. It was Frank Miller's Batman. This wasn't really in the universe of, um, you know, the normal DC universe. This was Frank Miller's own universe that he was creating his Batman in and what he wanted to show, what sides of, of the kind of incredibly screwed up nature that, you know, on the surface you don't really see, but, you know, if you rip a few layers back, the man's kind of crazy. Um, but, and of course, Jim Lee's artwork on this is stunning. There are some issues where they did the gatefold um, kind of pages which you opened out and you saw that a huge back cave. That was fantastic. That was like issues further on. But this is a number one and at the time, I was incredibly excited whether anyone else liked it or not. Um, Clerks, the comic book. I'm a huge fan of Kevin Smith. Um, I love pretty much all his movies. Um, Chasing Amy is one of my all-time favourites. Um, Clerks is certainly up there, at least the original. Um, it was just such a great way... Um, uh, such a unique way of telling a story and on their tight budget what they produced and what he's gone on to do 
further in the future is is just a, a testament to his his love of filmmaking and pop culture if you want to call it geek culture call it that but i'm going to call it pop culture um and it's here in clerks the comic book um you have um all the characters you know in even more ridiculous situations because obviously it's in a comic book he can do much more with it um a firm firm favorite so from the ridiculous to the sublime it's a black orchid um book one um by neil gaiman and um uh, dave mckean doing the, the most gorgeous painted artwork um again I didn't read this in this format. It was uh, republished in a British publication and I was just mesmerised by this. I was at an age when I first read it that I probably didn't understand really what was going on. It was it was kind of adult themed. It was for mature readers and I think at that time my head couldn't thoroughly understand and cope with what was going on here but there was something about it and I think a lot of it clearly had to do with Dave McKean's artwork um, it, it's just beautiful book and I'm desperately trying to find the rest of this run um, of, of Black Orchid um, this was a surprise but I really enjoyed this series it's Rover Red Charlie issue 1 Garth Ennis on Avatar Press, um, a post-apocalyptic universe where the human race have, for whatever reason, gone batshit crazy um, and just killed off the whole population, gone on a murderous rampage. And it's the story of these three dogs, that, which you can see on the front cover, um, uh, trying to live now without their owners. Uh, and kind of the, the adventures they get into but it, it's always seemed strange to me when um, in a comic book and I'm not so much talking about the kind of anthropomorphic characters animalistic characters that you see but when they are actual kind of animals <clears throat> and they talk I find that very strange but there's something very and I, this is a strange word to use but there's something very human about the conversations they have despite the fact that they're dogs and that appealed to me a great deal in this issue um, and this series. Um, Multiple Warheads issue one from Brandon Graham a huge fan of his artwork and um, I was turned on to Brandon Graham by Custom Brom Star Scott uh, when he was doing a kind of review of all his uh, shelves with all his graphic novels on and he showed me King City and I immediately went out to buy it because it sounded so different to what I'd been reading and I just fell in love with it. it it's crazy, it's non-linear, it's incredibly detailed though you look at it and there are these wide expanses of kind of I guess nothingness but there's all this going on over here at the same time and you just it's again it's not it's not the most detailed as in like Bernie Wrightson but it's more kind of a hip culture kind of art style to it but nonetheless it is a fantastic piece of artwork um, so I grab anything I can now by Brandon Graham uh, multiple warheads was uh, the first thing that came out after I'd read King City that was new of his um, and obviously lapped it up. Another recent acquirement but kind of really I really took um, to heart with because it was such a great use of storytelling and a kind of anthology series and that's Tom Strong's uh, Terrific Tales issue number one. Um, <clears throat> This is going, I mean, you. when I first saw this and I spoke to Tim about it in the comments section, uh, you know, you think of Alan Moore and you think, oh my God, this is going to be quite dark and there's going to be some like big ideas um, going on that, you know, probably will go over my head somewhat. But, you know, Tim eased me like, this, this isn't, this isn't dark, this isn't, this isn't that kind of book. 
And it isn't, it's a very light, it's a very fun, it's a kind of pure adventure with some great artists on here. Um, there's uh, Johnny Future, who's this girl here, and it's got some of the best Arthur Adams artwork I've seen in a long time. He's another, another comic book creator artist that just puts so much detail into his work, and you just wonder how he has the time to do that much work to to a panel, let alone a whole story. Uh, but these just had, again, that kind of Silver Age vibe to it, but with a modern sensibility. And if you read this, it, it's interesting to see um, the first stories, the, um, the Tom Strong stories that Alan Moore writes, he uses a different style of storytelling in each issue, uh, keeping it, giving it that fresh feel. Um, so I would highly recommend, if you haven't read this uh, kind of mini-series, uh, it lasted, I think it was 12 or 13 issues, um, to go out and find it. <coughs> um, from Miller World, back in um, probably, this was this the late 90s, early 2000s? It's Wanted, issue number one. Um, this is a tale of what if the bad guys won uh, and what would the world look like um, with artwork by JG Jones um, this was this was a lovely book to look at it was it was such a good um, kind of eye candy uh, book to, to view but the story was something that you hadn't really seen for a long long time and Matt Miller just went with it this this isn't the watchman because although the watchman the watchman were more about kind of like they were superheroes however damaged and dysfunctional they were they were still kind of like your superheroes um, but this was these were villains, these were out and out villains, they did horrible things, um, both violently, sexually, um, let's throw in some drugs in there as well, um, and this kicked it off to uh, a fantastic start. <clears throat> a more personable book, um, Grant Morrison again with Sean Murphy this time, Joe the Barbarian. Um, a beautiful again another beautiful book Sean Murphy's artwork on here again you have to look right through every panel because he packs so much detail in there that um, it, it's it's just you have to reread and reread it um, but this very kind of personal tale about this boy um, who kind of goes into a kind of I can't remember what he has now is it um, he has some sort of illness and his medicine is right at the bottom of the stairs and he goes on this kind of fantasy adventure um, that really is his journey from his attic bedroom down to the kitchen where his medicine is. Um, but it was just a beautiful start. They drew in a lot of um, kind of DC history stuff in there. You see DC characters mixed up in his fantasy world and it was just, I was excited for this book um, and I, I wanted more. It was only a limited series. I think there's six issues. Um, it's another great one for you to just to pick up um, and a recommendation from me. Um, finally, for issue ones, um, <clears throat> one of my, another of my favourite present day uh, running comics it is, of course, Five Ghosts. Uh, Frank Barbier and um, I can't remember his name, but Moneyham, um, doing this fantastic kind of boys adventure pulp tale um, of a guy who houses within him the spirits of kind of five literary characters. Um, we have Sherlock Holmes, we have kind of Robin Hood kind of character, we have Merlin, we have a kind of samurai warrior, and we have Dracula, and he can draw on those powers as and when. Um, but it, it's this kind of, it, it feels very much like a 1920s, 20s, 30s kind of high adventure black and white movie, but done in full Technicolor. It has just such a, a life and vitality about it and it throws in all the kind of stuff I love like the big horror movie monsters and, and the supernatural elements and I just 
I can't get enough of Five Ghosts and it needs to continue. It was it was originally slated as a five issue miniseries, but it did so well that it just had to continue and long may it. Now you cannot go through a top 50 favourite comic books without throwing some Kirby in there. It's just it's just wrong. If your top 50 doesn't have a Kirby comic in it, then get out of here! I'm joking. Um, but yeah, get out. And then the first two comics I've got here actually um, aren't written or drawn by Kirby, but they have certainly um, been influenced or have used characters that Kirby created. Um, and I'm starting, quite strangely, with The Mighty Thor. This is issue 388. It is Thor against one of the Celestials. The Celestials being one of Jack Kirby's creations. And it was, um, it was a, a kind of mega god against a god uh, and who could win. And it's kind of Thor's unrelenting stubbornness not to give up and save Earth from um, the Celestial because whenever a Celestial turns up uh, it's basically to judge um, a planet's worthiness, worthiness of being alive I guess and uh, obviously the Celestial had come to um, give judgment to Earth and Thor wasn't having that and so he goes and fights continually until his last breath to get to um, the, 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 the kind of centre of the celestial and put him down. Um, but certainly, clearly, Kirby influenced celestials. Um, something a lot more up to date and is blatantly influenced, especially in the art style of Kirby, it was Adam McGovern and Paolo Leandri's Night World. Um, the influences are obvious here, um, but and it still ha and it has this kind of EC kind of eerie, creepy comic books um, of like the late sixties and the early seventies. Uh, it has that feel onto it as well, but coupled with um, a, a kind of Kirby brash, bright, colourful sensibility and. These two guys, they need to come out with another mini-series. I need more of the Night World. Um, I think, who was the last one who picked this up? I can't remember, someone just showed it in the video. Um, but I'm glad they picked it up to try. Oh, it was Bat Josh. I, if you like Kirby, you must love this. You must. Now on to those Kirby books. I picked three out um, because I could have picked... I could have picked a whole 50 of them out, to be honest. Um, I'm starting with New Gods, issue number one. Uh, this has more of, um, not a sentimental value, but I bought this for myself for my 40th birthday. I decided I wanted to buy something from the year I was born. I tried to get it around the September mark because that's when my birthday is. Um, but couldn't find anything that really kind of stood out. But, you know, back then, you know, there was the the talk of Kirby. I didn't know a great deal about him. I obviously knew who he was. I hadn't collected much stuff, so I thought, right, I'm going to find something with Kirby. And it just so happened in 1971, New Gods came out. So I bought this and... <laughs> there are no words sometimes um, that imagination and creativity that must have been going through this guy's head and to know that he was probably drawing four five six other stories at the same time is just something you know you just can't get your head around uh, and certainly you know you don't get that now um, you know okay Remender is writing a lot of books at the moment but he's not drawing them as well which is what Kirby was doing and he would churn these out and they would be incredible quality and, and this was the start obviously of something incredibly special with the new gods uh, this certainly has sentimental value for me um, and just showed me the kindness of the community and certainly this one person who is who is my best bud here um, 
it's commandy issue number one. After getting this, um, I just threw myself into Kirby and I bought a lot of commandy uh, at very cheap prices, but kept looking at commandy issue one and going, I can't, I can't really justify spending that kind of money. So, I mean, it, it's a ridiculous notion. The older a book is, um, especially if it's uh, of this kind of calibre, you're going to have to pay top dollar for it. And I, I don't like to do that. I like to buy them cheap or, in this instance, get them for nothing. But I am, I'm still, to this day, so grateful to Scott for giving me this issue one of Commandy. Um, not only did it cement my love for, for Jack Kirby, um, but just made my appreciation um, of my fellow YouTuber increase all the more um, to show that he would give me something that I personally thought was incredibly valuable. Um, it, it's not something, I mean, this makes doesn't make me sound good, but it's not something that I would personally do for someone else. But Scott has such a huge heart um, and I love him to bits and I miss him a lot um, and I'm just grateful that you know he has that big heart to to have given me Commandy issue one. Um, finally for the Kirby's it's Fantastic Four issue number 84. Um, is there better Fantastic Four issues than this, uh, written and draw, uh, sorry, drawn by Kirby? Probably, but I don't own it, and I can only um, give you my top 50 of comic books I own. Um, but this was still an outstanding issue of Kirby. Um, here we have the Fantastic Four coming to Latveria, um, Doom's kind of town that he owns, his country that he owns I should say, um, and not being allowed to um, leave basically. Um, and it's just lo full of loads of fun Kirby um, artwork in here and it's one of my favourite um, issues that I have of Kirby's artwork. Okay so we're on to the penultimate um, themes that I have for my top 50 and this is my kind of two favorite kind of street level characters and I guess it's just purely coincidence I didn't realize this when I first started collecting them that they have uh, very much a connection with each other and that is of course let me get this right it's Daredevil and the Punisher um, I'm going to just put that down at the moment because those aren't the ones that I want to talk about straight away. Let's talk, talk about Daredevil first. I picked out um, issue number 32 of Brian Michael Bendis and Alec Maleev's huge long run of uh, Daredevil which started out on their Marvel Knights imprint um, and then got drawn back into the normal Marvel U. Uh, and this was kind of like, although there'd been rumblings previously, this is where it kind of came to a head and all the kind of Matt Murdock is Daredevil rumour blew up and Brian Michael Bendis dragged Daredevil kicking and screaming to the depths when you thought he'd hit rock bottom he would knock him down again and again and again and again and again. And as much as everyone is loving the new kind of fresh, lighter take on Daredevil, despite, you know, he still gets his all his adventures and stuff in, um, I really like the darker side of Daredevil. Um, this, this grittier version. Um, and... Uh, I don't... I'm lost for words sometimes. Um, the the run was so huge, uh, and Bendis did so much uh, with this character and built it up from what was essentially a, a, a C lister, a B lister character, uh, and just to the point now that you know there's been a TV show now made of it, and it was a huge success. Um, and this came from a comic book that really wasn't doing you know huge sales at all um, and to grow that character into what it's become is is a great feat and I think basically it started here.
Um, the other Daredevil issue I bought was an earlier issue on the Marvel Knights run. It's issue 8. Um, Daredevil does have connections to um, quite a few characters in the Marvel U. And certainly one of them is Spider-Man. Um, and they kind of... <clears throat> they have this relationship with each other where they can... They can just sit there and talk and kind of offload, so to speak, um, about their problems and in some ways relate and in other ways help out each other. Uh, and I just like the, the relationship, the kind of, it's not a bromance in, in any way, but there is, there is a brotherhood there um, with Daredevil clearly being the older brother. Uh, but I really, I really like this this issue, the conversation that they have um, surrounding it. Uh, I don't, again, I don't really want to go on too much detail because this video is just going to go on and on and on. But another great issue that you should you should read. Let's move on to the Punisher. Um, people are surprised that I like the Punisher. I don't know why. Every time I bring up mention of Punisher, they go. What, you like The Punisher? Well, yes, I do. Um, I've read a great many um, issues of Punisher in my time. I have probably almost a full short box, which doesn't sound a great many comics, but um, he is a character that I really enjoy. Um, and no more so than in um, a one-shot Max um, comic series, um, The Cell. And this is um, Frank locked inside a prison, purposefully um, and he gets to have his final revenge on uh, the the people um, the kind of master puppeteers who originally started his life of vengeance um, these are kind of like the the mafia dons the the godfathers of of the kind of criminal underworld um, who are hiding out in a, a basement of a prison in a cell and it, it's Frank's journey to get to them and wreak his final revenge. It's done so well. Um, written by Garth Ennis with Louis LaRossas and Scott Kublish, Kublishi on um, art. Um, just a fantastic book. <coughs> Um, Greg Rucker um, and uh, Marco Cicchetto this series of The Punisher wow uh, this is the final issue it's issue number 16 um, again wow um, took place took Punisher to places um, just I didn't think they could or would uh, brought in a new character that is almost kind of like a protege um, for the Punisher. Um, dealt with some big ideas and are kind of connected in some way to one of the issues because I've picked out a couple of kind of crossover between Daredevil and Punisher. Um, Greg, um, yeah, Greg Rucker looked back at the history of Punisher and what had happened previously and used characters that hadn't you know, they were kind of blips, really, uh, in the kind of Daredevil and the Punisher kind of back history. Um, and made them into these fully-fledged, char reoccurring characters. Um, and that's what happened in um, issue 257 of Daredevil. Um, and we've got, for another crossover, issue 183 of Daredevil. Um, these are great foils for each other, these two characters. Um, Daredevil will, while both of them are there for kind of like justice, they want justice to happen to these criminals, clearly Punisher is um, willing to go and cross that line uh, and put them out for good while Daredevil is is obviously kind of legal eagle uh, and wants um, the law, the just justice and law to uh, prevail and, and bring down these um, these criminals. So the two characters are, are 
you know, constantly at loggerheads, despite the fact that, you know, time and time again, they work with each other so often. And I just think they're great kind of characters um, in and of themselves, but together, um, the way these two work uh, for and against each other uh, is something really quite special. Okay, so I'm one short. Um, yes, I got to the point where I was like, I can't go through my boxes anymore. I know I'm only one issue off, but I didn't just want to throw something in just for the sake of it. So I thought I'd throw the question to you. What were you expecting to see in my top 50? Um, what... Um, and you've got to remember, and this will probably be easier for people who know my comic book habits and what I've read in singles and what I've read in graphic novels. Um, so what did you expect to see in here that you didn't? And that's it. That's my top 50. Thank you very much for watching. Oh my God, thank God that's over. I hope you enjoyed yourself. If you are still here, it is very much appreciated. Until next time, bye-bye.